So first, I'm going to cut it off of the bat. And as I did that, I, when I got to the outer edge on the back side, I pulled through really gently so that I wouldn't distort the piece too much. I'll sandwich it between two bats and use those to flip the piece upside down. I'll gently peel the, the original bat off of the bottom. And now that I'm upside down, I will oval the piece. So I'll just position my thumbs on either side of the piece and gently pull it out. I don't try to go all at once, just a little bit at a time, and get it into the shape that I want the oval tray, whether I want it to be really long and skinny like an olive tray or a little bit wider for serving more food. And then once this is in shape, then I'll let it stiffen up again. It's too soft to hand build on right now. This is the tray form that we cut off of the bat a little while ago. So now it is much stiffer than it was before so that when I go to press the slab onto the bottom, the walls will be able to support the pressure. The first thing I'm going to do is I want this tray to be a little bit more elegant than just attaching a slab right onto the bottom. And to do that, to give it a little bit more lift up off of the table, I'm gonna take a dart at each end. So before I do that, I will once again cut off this extra thickness of clay down at the bottom. And I know that I'm going to cut down this edge again, so if I'm not perfectly even all the way around, it's okay. And then I'll cut a triangle out of each end of the pot. And I start out and I mark the center of each point. And then sometimes I'll measure the same distance out from that middle edge if I have a ruler or just with my hands or the width of a tool and cut a triangle. Then I'll do the same thing out of the other end of the piece and take that same distance. And then to check myself to make sure that I cut the same amount out of both sides, I can take the scrap piece from this end and fit it into the other end and it should fill in the space. And it looks like my second cut was a little bit bigger than the first. So I'll go back in and remove just a little bit more material and then that piece fits in. Now we've cut those two triangles out and these two edges will get folded into each other. And before I do that, this area is going to be squeezed pretty extremely. And to make sure that the clay doesn't crack, I add just a little bit of moisture on the area where it'll be curved. And it also helps to run a rib over the surface of the clay. Now I'll slip and score both of these edges. And I'm doing them both at the same time because when I fold one end, end in, the other end will want to fold also. So it makes sense to get them both prepped at the same time. And then gently, I start at the top corner and then support the edge as I fold these in. and firmly pinch the two edges together. I go back along with a soft rib, and again, supporting from the inside, smooth the two parts together. If you feel like your edges are too thin and you're not making a good connection between the parts, you can add a, a coil onto the inside of that seam to give you a little bit more surface area for these two parts to attach. But these seem like they'll stay. And then at this point, I would take this piece and cover it up, set it to the side, and let those seams homogenize so that they won't come apart as I go to attach the bottom slab. This piece has had a little bit to set up and for the seams to become friends with one another. So hopefully when we go to press the bottom on, they won't split open. This is one of the forms that I make that does have four feet. So sometimes a little sanding is required when it comes out of the kiln to make it sit flat. And I'll have the four feet be about here and here on the piece. On the end, 
I'm again cutting with the same bevel that we did on all of the other pieces so that I have a nice area of a clay for attaching the slab to. I'll do my two ends first. And you could with this piece as well take this excess and tack it onto the other side to make sure that you're cutting evenly. And then I'll cut a curve across the middle with the inside edge higher than the outside edge. Then I'm gonna change the footprint of this piece just a little bit. I'll take the feet and pull them out slightly. This helps the piece to stand a little bit more sturdily. And now we're ready to attach the slab. So I've got a piece of slab that's about the right size, but definitely bigger than what I need. So I'll lay it onto the piece and make sure that it goes down into that groove in the center and then cut away any excess. But I still have at least half an inch all the way around the foot on the bottom. To get my scoring line, I'll gently press these two parts together all the way around the piece and I'm accent accentuating the center so that I have definite four points for the feet to touch down. On this piece, since it is bilaterally symmetrical, I need to give myself a little register mark so I know how the pieces fit back together. So I just made a little line in front of one of the feet and then a line on the side of the pot. Slip and score. Score back through the slip. Then when I go to place this slab back on the piece, I'll use my indicator mark to make sure I'm putting the right sides together. If you measured and made your piece perfectly symmetrical, it wouldn't matter. But as you probably noticed, I very rarely measure, so it's important to have that line to tell me how to put this back on. Press the two parts together. Since this piece is slightly larger, it's a good idea to sandwich it between two bats to flip it over. And you can see at this point that I have a little bit of rocking going on. Again, that's because it's got four feet instead of three. But when I flip it over, those should settle down a little bit so that it'll sit flat, and it did. Along the inside edge, I'll take my soft paintbrush and smooth the two parts together. That thinner edge on the inside wall aids in this. Often with a more open form like this, I'll be more inclined to add a tiny coil into the seam since it is very open and exposed. On all of my more vertical forms, I never add a coil. Then go along the outside, smooth the slip into the bottom slab. And at this point, since the slab is attached, I can get rid of that little mark that I made on the outside. And with this slab, when I cut it, I'm going to do something just a little bit different than the other forms. I'm gonna cut further out on the parts that are raised up from the table. I'll still do the small point in front of each foot. But I'm cutting, I guess, about half an inch away from the piece. So it's significantly longer. And then I find up under this corner, it's really difficult to cut with the knife because of your proximity to the thrown part. So I'll clean that up once we flip it back over. Again, sandwich between two bats and flip. And you can see at this end, I haven't cut to the right angle. So I'll go back in now that I can see what I'm doing a little bit better. And also this edge ended up being at a pretty severe angle and I'd like it to be more vertical. So I'll just cut off the point of that edge. That'll make it a little bit easier to smooth out. Same thing on the other end. And we're ready to smooth and fold. Now I'll start pressing this edge down and in the middle where I left that longer piece, rather than folding it all the way down, I'm gonna pull it away from the pot just a little bit. And it starts to become like another petal, another layer of curves on the pot. 
but I'll wait and do that when I flip the piece over. So as I attach, I'm mostly attaching up here towards the bottom of the pot and leaving this edge out away from the pot itself. Usually these long skinny pieces want to, when they're sandwiched, come in, but it's really easy to pull it back out again. And I won't flip this upside down again, so it'll be, it'll stay open. Now you can see that this edge is pulled away from the pot and I want to accentuate that. So I'll do the same thing that I do to my top lip and just start to pull it down and out, but make sure that the bottom of that petal is still attached to the pot because of course if it pulls out then the tray would leak, which would not be good. And I'll do the same thing on the other side. If I make even larger serving trays, sometimes I'll have multiple areas where the slab pulls away from the pot. Sometimes on fancy vases or on my butter box, I'll do this same detail. It's kind of a nice little accent. I tend not to do it on bowls or on mugs. It seems like for things like that, they get banged around a lot more. It's an area that could easily be chipped. But for something more fancy and formal like this, it's a nice detail. To fill in this seam line, since it is so open and exposed, I'm just adding a very, very thin coil. To finish the lip of this pot, I will cut out some of the top so that this will undulate and as I pull the lip out, it'll stay about the same distance away from the pot. If I were to just pull this out, I'd end up with a really long edge and it would look a little bit awkward. So I cut out the center section and then I'm cutting out two more curves towards the end on each side. So six cuts for this tray. Again, add a little moisture. And then run the top lip between my fingers, pinching it slightly to moisten up the surface and make it curve really well. I'll start with the middle and pull that out. And I'm supporting the side wall a little bit on the sides as I do this. And I'll do the center of the ends. Pull that out. As I'm doing this, I'm also thinking about how I'll glaze the piece. And on each one of these points will be where I'll put my brown dots. And then last, I'll make sure that the whole form is symmetrical, front and back, left and right. Maybe accentuate these places where it undulates in. And there we have a boat serving tray.